Always excited to talk about the great sport of alpine skiing and joined on the line today by a record breaker, competed in Beijing earlier this year, finished 23rd in the giant slalom, which was a record, an equal record for an Australian at the Olympics, but a record for an Australian male at the Olympics and uh, has had an amazing career and plenty still to come. It is a pleasure to welcome to Off the Podium, the one, the only, Louis Mullen Schulter. Louis, first of all, pleasure to have you on the show today. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, um, exciting to always do a podcast whenever I can. Does it does it get tiring to hear those words that you're a record holder now, like best ever <laughs> finished, uh, by an Australian male at an Olympics in in giant slalom? I mean that that must still ring true into your ears. Like wow, that's that's pretty awesome achievement. Yeah, I think it. I think it is. I think it's uh, a bittersweet one for me because. Um, as any athlete probably knows, you're never quite satisfied with any result. <laughs> so um, it's one of those ones where I'm, you know, I was pretty happy with it, and it's it's awesome to have that kind of achievement. But it's kind of like it almost feels like the the start rather than the the apex of a of a career for me, at least. It's the I hope. Like that. So. Yeah, more to come. Basically, from that, you'll be there'll be improvements to come. I, I'm intrigued. Exactly. Just- your beginnings. I mean, I, I grew up in Hobart. To me, Hobart's the smallest place in the world, but you're from a place which is literally smaller than Hobart, uh, Harrietville, a uh, place yeah. that probably not a lot of people in Australia might be too familiar with. Tell, tell our uh, listeners a little bit about Harrietville and how did this make you end up on skis, essentially? Yeah. So I grew up, actually, the funny thing is like I was born in Melbourne, um, but when I was very young, uh, my family decided they wanted to move to the country. So we actually moved to Harrietville, which is, uh, at least when I was there, it was probably between three and 5,000 people in the town. Um, so pretty, pretty small. The primary school I went to there was, there was about 30 of us between prep to grade six. Wow. Um, so that's all, all grades. I think my grade, we had five of us in it. Wow. And then we were Jeez. like a big, we were a big class. So <laughs> definitely, um, you, you knew your friends well. Um, and for mom and dad couldn't really lose you in town. Really. You'd, you'd be at one of the four <laughs> friends you had house. So, so it's not so bad. Um, but I think my dad, you know, started skiing when he was young. Um, or when he, he taught himself when he was 20. And then from that, uh, I really, he kind of took my sister and I skiing, um, and his favorite place to always ski was Hotham, um, which is actually at the top of Harryville is at the base of Mount Hotham. Um, and that's kind of where my love for skiing started. And actually when I was eight years old, I got recruited actually by the, um, race club at Mount Hotham to start doing the race program there. And, and I kind of just, my love for skiing grew and grew from there. I mean, when I started, all I knew was. I like to go fast and I like skiing. So, you know, it just seemed like a fun thing to do. And then, you know, before I knew it, I was, um, you know, competing in Europe and America and and living away from home for eight, 10 months of the year. I I haven't done my research on this, Louis, but I I can't imagine there are many Olympians from Harrietville in a, in a town that size. I mean, it's obviously close to Mount Hotham. So maybe there are a few there, but are you aware of any other Olympians that come from Harrietville or are you it? Not to my knowledge. Um, I know Paul Punker, which is just down the road. Um, one of fellow Alpine skier, actually Greta Small, mm-hmm. is from Paul Punker, which is probably half an hour's drive down the road. So there are a few of us in the valley, but um, I'm not to my knowledge that there are any uh, Olympians from Harrietville, so to speak. Future, future statue. I'm just saying there's going to be a future statue <laughs> to you in the town. Basically, hopefully, so I gotta yeah, do yeah. I gotta do a few more impressive things I think before I get a statue. <laughs> we'll we'll keep an eye on that. But one thing that I found fascinating, and I, I don't know if you've ever realised this, you were obviously born in March 1998, less than a month after Zali Stegel won Australia's only ever alpine skiing medal. So I'm just gonna say maybe this was a bit of fate that you sort of come from a bit of a skiing family, and then you've got this great moment in alpine skiing for Australia where we win an Olympic medal, and then you're born. So it's kind of like everything just falling into place there. Zali wins a medal, you're born, boom, the future of Australian alpine skiing. I honestly can't say I ever knew that, but I, I think my dad, my dad always used to tell me, so I was born in Melbourne and I was actually born in Fitzroy. Um, and he always says I was born um, on the practice day of when the F1 was in Melbourne. Ah, 
Yes. Um, so he always said I was born to be a racer because the F1 <laughs> was going on at the same time. So that was his, that was his reason why I was always racing. But I think that one's probably a little better. Yeah. Well, I, I'm a big F1 fan. So I like the, the connections with that as well, though. So, and, and Fitzroy, does that then mean that you grow up in a Lions household? Are you Brisbane fans uh, or how does that work? Actually, a rich, I'm a Richmond fan through and through. Ah, wow. So I was born, You've had a good few grandma, years then. <laughs> yeah, my grandma, my grandma said I was born in the year of the Tigers, so I had to be a Tigers fan. So right, you're in Lions territory, but you end up. Ty- I, I like all these kind of like yeah. parallels going on there. You know, Formula I'm One fast uh, skiing, uh, like it's all happening. I like that. Yeah, I got a family, a bit of bit of superstition in my family, so <laughs> you got to the- have all the connections. Exactly. So in terms of the skiing, I mean, outside of, of that, were you very athletic, sporty? Was this something growing up that you tried your hand at all different sports or was it always a focus on skiing? This is what I want to focus on. Yeah. So I really, I mean, I, until I moved to America when I was 16, actually to um, continue to ski race and, and finish my high school um, in, in America and do it while ski racing. Um, but until that point, I really basically tried my hand and loved pretty much any sport I could get a hold of. Um, the biggest was I used to be a big and still am really into mountain biking. Um, growing up in the country, that was always like really close by. So I loved doing that, whether it was AFL, um, you know, when I was in primary school or, or even doing, you know, we used to do cross country races um, and it, it really anything. I would, I would think I went to regionals one time for swimming. It was just like whatever sport I could do, I did do. Um, it was like, I think for me, I never loved school as much as I did sport. So it was like any sport I could do to get out of doing schoolwork, I was always in for. And was it sort of, I mean, besides AFL, those sports are Olympic sports. Was this an Olympic dream that you had, or was it just happened that these sports that you enjoyed happened to have a long-term goal potentially of an Olympics? I think I never really, yeah. And I wouldn't say it was ever an, an Olympic goal from a young age, um, I just, I knew I loved sport and I, and I think I just fell into any sport. I luckily fell into any sport that was, I guess, kind of Olympic based, but um, yeah, I really just went after whatever I, I could do. And, and then once I kind of grew older and, and realized that, you know, I was looking for a career in, in sport, I think then that was kind of when the realization was, okay, what's, what's my long-term goals? Is it, Olympics is it you know world championships where do I want to want to be in the future I guess and was that at that point when you're making that decision you looked at say certain sports to realize what you enjoyed the most what maybe you were were better at and was that sort of a a skiing versus I mean you said you went to regionals a swimming choice like I mean how did ultimately skiing come out on top through all the sports that you did play um I I don't actually really know I think there was a point in time um, so I, I moved back to the city. I, I, went, I did started high school in uh, Melbourne um, just to go to a bigger high school. And I was actually doing a rowing crew um, at the time and was fairly good at that. And I think I kind of knew I needed to look at picking one sport over another just because it was so hard to, you know, go from one season to the next and to the next and to the next. And, and at some point I knew I needed to, if I was going to do a sport, follow that sport as hard or do that sport as hard as I could and put as much effort into that sport. And I think I chose, I think I chose skiing because it it was different, you know, being from Australia, it's not necessarily a sport that you think of Australians are necessarily amazing at, or, or there are a ton of us in it. Um, but it's kind of one that I always loved. And, and from a young age, I was in ski racing and in skiing and, and it just seemed right to me that that would be the sport to choose. And was it a case of when you're skiing, ultimately you're talking ski racing, alpine skiing, of course, but I know you've obviously dabbled a bit in, in freestyle. Uh, I'm not sure if cross country was an option. I mean, were you sort of trying your hand at all of them and then eventually settled on the racing aspect because maybe the speed aspect, as you keep talking about, as being something versus cross country where it's obviously a little bit you yeah. know, more long-term, a bit more endurance-based? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I whether it was into schools or, or anything like that, or even doing, you know, rail jams or freestyle competitions, I was very much doing any and every on snow sport I could um, because I love, I love the snow and I love that area. And then I kind of whittled down. I, I knew I didn't want to be an endurance athlete. I didn't, 
really love it enough. <laughs> um, so cross country was kind of out of the question. And then it, it took me a long time to really pick one over the other with freestyle. I, I think I always loved doing it, but there was less, when, at least when I was younger, there, it, w- it still wasn't as big as it is today. And it, it wasn't really considered, um, I mean, it was considered professional, but not quite to the same extent it is now. Um, so I think that's kind of where I, I chose racing and then, yeah, I just, once I chose it, it, I never really looked back. I mean, I've always still done freestyle and I love to go powder skiing whenever I can, but it, the main focus is for sure racing. Is that something that you think if say you were 10 years younger right now and it was different that maybe it would be a more of a freestyle focus? So I guess kind of at that point growing up, yeah, what Dale Begg Smith was doing pretty good in the freestyle world around about that point. And, you know, we were starting to really do all right in, in moguls and everything moving forward. But do you think looking back on it now, if it, it might have been something more focused on freestyle, if it was, say, the extent it is today back when you were getting started? I think maybe. Um, I think one of the probably the biggest reason I still maybe would say I would still go to racing is is just because of the... I guess the culture in racing, you know, it's such, there's like freestyle is a, has an amazing culture where it's this, you know, the love of the sport and, and people are, you know, that I, it, for me looking outside in, it, it seems like there's a little less competitive nature in it. Whereas skiing is this, you know, it's such a long heritage in the world of ski racing um, with, you know, high competition and, and that massive competitiveness, it just seemed right for me. You know, I've always been an ultra competitive person. So it just felt like the best fit, I guess. And in terms of when you make that decision, of course, within Alpine, then you've got all the disciplines from high speed, downhill, super G to the technical side of things with, you know, slalom and parallel giant slalom and those sort of things. So do you then work your abilities out and then that um, I'm more of a technical guy than a speed guy? Or do you kind of try your hand at a bit of everything until you maybe progress through on the European or the American scene to realize, well, this is where maybe my skills lie at? Yeah, so I I started out um, when I got into uh, FIS, which is open competition um, in ski racing. That's from 16 years old. I started out doing all disciplines, so downhill um, through the slalom um, and everything in between. And then it, it kind of, for me, I loved everything and I still do love speed disciplines. Um, but I think the reason I chose technical disciplines of like slalom and GS is uh, the accessibility of it to do generally to do speed you need a quite a few whether it's staff or or people around you to help organize that training you know there's a lot there's a lot more speed involved there's a lot more safety that needs to be there um there's just a whole lot more planning that is involved in it and and to get training it was just much harder for me um in those speed disciplines which kind of naturally pushed me i guess in my eyes towards technical disciplines um, and I've always loved, you know, that challenge. I think, I think the technical disciplines have a, you know, it's, it's lower speed in terms of top speed, but it's a higher speed in terms of, you know, the rate at which you're turning the, the pressure on your body and, and, you know, everything is such quick, fast responses from the, from the body, um, that it just felt, felt natural for me, I guess. And do you then need to translate that into your training? If you're focusing more on the technical side of things and you're hitting the gym, for example, I can imagine that a a technical skier who's hitting poles for most of their living versus somebody who wants to go as fast as they possibly can needs to do different weights in a gym or different sort of training. Is it, is it the case of that you got to sort of do things differently? Yeah, definitely. So whether it's um, just things like what muscle groups you're training, how you're training them, um, I've worked probably work quite a lot more than I think a speed skier would on on fast switch muscles. Um, so how how reactive your muscles are, the the power that your muscle can produce rather than the sheer mass, um, things like that, where you know you need your muscles to be much more reactive than say someone who's going maybe 120 kilometers an hour, but they need to be much more stable. Um, and have just a lot more sheer strength to hold that speed rather than someone who's maybe going only 60 kilometers an hour, 80 kilometers an hour, but they're moving at their muscles at a f- much faster rate. So it's, it's definitely tailored. Um, my gym is definitely tailored towards, towards the technical disciplines in that respect. 
And how's that when you hit a gym and you're maybe there with other athletes who are, I don't know how they're training, that sort of stuff. Do you, are you there with many other skiers are doing that? I mean, obviously, if you're in the, the US and you're sort of training with your fellow skiers, but in other situations where maybe you're not around other skiers, you, you know, versus other athletes, how's that conversation end up going down? It's, it definitely is a, a little bit strange. Um, I think ski races, the hard thing with skiing is there's very few, if not any, I mean, it depends who you ask and, um, there's yeah, very few, if not any really speci- like ski specific, um, gym exercises. So you're kind of always, you know, doing a, a mix between Olympic lifting and, and then you're doing a whole bunch of like almost sprinting. Like at least for me, I do quite a bit of sprinting and plyometrics work. So you end up kind of overlapping with a lot of different sports, um, in one way or another, but you end up taking a little bit from say someone who's doing track and field events where you're taking some of their, you know, plyometrics and sprinting work, but then you're also doing Olympic lifting, like a, you know, an Olympic power lifter or, so you kind of end up overlapping with everyone. Um, so which is I was, kind I was of thinking fun. the arms in general, like the push out of the gate. And then with a the slalom, you, you're whacking heavily into those things. So I can imagine there is a bit of arm work going on there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So they end up, yeah, having, need to having a lot of shoulder stability and, and, and things like that. So you can't really just focus on, you know, just your legs or just your core or just your arms. You have to kind of have everything there and everything needs to be, you know, working as one. You mentioned the move to North America. Is there a decision when it comes to choosing say between North America and and Europe? Because I can imagine they're the two hotbeds for, for skiing. I mean, do you choose between the two or is it a case of, is it an Australian route to go to North America? I mean, how does that decision come about? Um, so for me, the decision came about primarily due to, um, school. My parents still wanted me to have a, um, an education. Um, and I think being Australian and being from a, a predominantly English speaking country, um, the U S made the most sense in terms of schooling, um, which is why I chose um, to go to the U S. So I finished high school there. Um, and then, and then continue to race up, um, a little bit through my university career in, in America. And that was purely just because of school. Um, but I think in terms of a pure racing standpoint and, and where the most high level skiing is, it's for sure in Europe, but obviously it's a much harder place to go and finish high school or, or, you know, transition to living there almost full time as a 16, 17, 18 year old. Which, so I think that's. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. I can imagine, you know, going to the US to go to a, a, a college environment. You end up at, at Montana State. Now, for most Australians, we grow up and our experience of US college is American Pie or some, you know, college movie yeah, stuff like yeah, that. So I don't sure. know if you go into it with that perspective. But I mean, is it much of a culture shock going from a school in Australia to school in the US? I think definitely. I mean, it's just a different. Um, you know, different education system, different learning levels. Um, I think the biggest thing I took away from it was in Australia, you know, especially in higher education, you see um, something like uh, your high, like at university level, you would say in Australia, you know, you ever that there's that late age old saying of D's get degrees of, you know, <laughs> you, you get a pass mark and, and you're calling yeah. it good. Um, whereas in, in America, it's much more, you know, if you're not on that track of getting 90, a hundred percent on a test, you know, you don't know the, the, the subject. Um, so it's very much different in that regard. Um, as well as just that, you know, the environments are different. Often people are much more just at school and then, you know, they'll get a job after. Whereas I think in Australia, people are doing, you know, two at once, you know, they're working a job whilst finishing their education and, and so on. So I think there is, they're probably the two biggest ones that I see that are different. Um, but it's just, a, it's just an adjustment, you know, like anything you, you figure it out and you get used to it and then, and then figure out how to make the most of it from your situation. Well, it's also that sporting culture that colleges have over there. I mean, you're with the, the MSU Bobcats, uh, you know, obviously with the NCAA championships, uh, you end up on second team All-American in 2019, finished seventh in the slalom. You were 10th in the giant slalom in 2019-20. So obviously alongside your studies, you've got this great competitive outlet as well. I mean, how 
does that help you sort of towards what you're you're going towards? Because you're obviously getting a great education, but at the same time, you're getting this great competitive environment that the American college system really does bring. For sure, and I think and I think it helps. It helps a lot, and I think for me, the biggest reason why I chose to go that route was I wasn't entirely sure where you know I my future was in skiing. I knew I loved it still, and I and I I was kind of I still felt young to the respect of not knowing um, how to fully commit um, to a, to a sport or, or a career, I guess I should say. Um, so it going to that university and then spending the time in America and being able to still compete there, it gave me the opportunity to grow up as a person, I would say, and, and decide, okay, I really do want this as a career path and how do I now, you know, follow that rather than just continue kind of figuring it out, I guess I should say. I did watch an interview with you on, on YouTube at the Bobcats and it seemed like you were trying to be recruited as a punter for their football team. Do they, do they ever get you uh, to, to do that? I mean, obviously a lot of uh, AFL players have gone to play in the NFL. So, I mean, how did that end up going for you there? I can't, I can't say I ever went. I think I was too worried that uh, if I did go, I might, I might stay. <laughs> um, as it, there's a there's a bit more money in NFL than there is in uh, in alpine skiing, so I was a little worried about that. But um, no, it's it's fun, and I mean, you, we still get to train in the gym a little bit with the football guys, and you see them around a lot. So it's it's cool to be out of being in an environment where you get to interact with other sports and, and see how they train and, and see where you know their performances are. And and you know, a few of the guys that I was at university there um, are now. Uh, in the NFL and then doing training camps with teams there. So it's cool to see, you know, other athletes from around where you were, you know, progressing and, and following their careers as well. Can you then do the opposite? Because obviously they're very excited to see this guy from Australia can kick a ball long, but we've seen recent success in Australia with getting some Americans into the AFL, obviously Mason Cox and, you know, people like that. Like, are you then maybe secretly going like, ah, oh, you know, you might not make the NBA in basketball, you can make the AFL, or you might not make the NFL, but you can come and play. Like, do you try and get them to come to Australia and try their hand at AFL? A little bit. I think it's, it's a tough sport to explain. Um, I think it's one of those sports... You know, if you grow up with it, you know exactly what's going on and, and, and how it works. But I think trying to tell people what it is and how it works, I think they get really quite confused. <laughs> um, it's one of those games that's easier to see. Once you see it, you understand it rather than just trying to explain the rules to someone over a conversation. Um, but I think I think it's one of those things Australia is, you know, more it seems like in, in sport is becoming more and more popular and, and you're seeing basketball players come out of Australia and, and, and all sorts. So I think it's, you know, it's a two way street or it's becoming more and more of a two way street. I think with athletes in Australia and from around the world. And then you try explaining cricket and you realize that that's <laughs> impossible to explain. <laughs> exactly. You get there eventually with AFL, but cricket, you're like, no, nah, I give up. Like, just watch. Yeah. They're like, so why is it over multiple days? And you're like, well, I don't know, but just, it is. So it's okay. Don't worry. Just, just watch it. You'll get it eventually. All right. Just, yeah. just, just get it that way. But you talking about, obviously we'll get to Beijing Olympic experiences, but you had an earlier Olympic experience with the youth Olympics in 2016. This is obviously only the second ever winter youth Olympics, but how did that experience come about and uh you know was it something that as soon as it's maybe offered to you you're like wow yeah absolutely i want to give this a go yeah for sure i mean i think i i, I kind of knew that it was on the radar for me and and i was at that point still very young in, in ski racing and, and in the world of ski racing um but i knew it was something that you know would be exciting and, and for me it felt like the first real learning point of like okay what is the actual world of skiing like not just in you know whether it's just in north america at that at that point that was really all only place i was racing or just in australia like what is ski racing on a worldwide level look like um so that was kind of a really big eye opener for me and, and being able to see okay these are you know all the countries that are competing and, and there's people that are you know this is their life's work and their, they, you know, their families have been in ski racing and, and so on and so forth. It's like generational over there. Um, I think for some of those countries. So it's, it's kind of cool to see. It's, it's almost like their equivalent of an AFL, you know, where it's, 
it's like everyone has a team or, or in that sense, you know, everyone has a favorite athlete that they're always following and they're rooting for. And, and I think it was for me, the biggest way to experience it without kind of realizing how big it was, I guess I should say. And I think it showed me as well where I wanted to go. You know, it was like the first time I was like, okay, this is cool, but now I want to actually try and get to a, a real Olympics and, and do it on the big stage. Which I think we've talked a lot about on this show for our winter athletes. A multi-sport event is not a common occurrence. It's all well and good for a lot of our summer athletes. We've just had the Commonwealth Games, of course, you know, and, and there's certain other events where they can experience what it's like to go to a multi-sport event a lot of the time. But for our winter athletes, it's not really something you do. So I can imagine that that experience alone, but then as you say, sort of a preparation then to go towards a, a full Olympics in the future. I mean, looking back now that you've gone to the the senior, I don't know how to differentiate between the youth and the, you know, the, the adult sure. and the children Olympics, sure. Uh, looking back on your experiences in Beijing, how much did what you experienced in 2016 help you to not just the competitive side of things, but everything that comes with like village life and the media and things along those lines? I think, I think a lot. I think um, as well, you know, with any, with any competing. And I think the biggest, the best way I was explained to it and, and it really resonated with me was, you know, the Olympics are like any other competition, just everything is a little more. So, you know, there's more media, there's more, uh, you know, hype around it. There's more, you know, country involvement. There's more people there. Um, uh, and, and just a little bit, you know, everything is just a little more logistics, housing, village life, you know, it, it's just, it's just kind of, put on, you know, every, it's like the dial's been turned up to 11 on everything. So I think, I think having that experience of, of the, of the youth Olympics kind of showed me, okay, this is where it kind of looks like, whether it's village life, you know, you're around a lot of other nations, around a lot of other teams, athletes, you see a lot of different sports, you kind of know how to interact in that environment. And then getting to go to the Olympics in Beijing, it was like, okay, I kind of, it felt like a little more normal, I should say um just by having that experience that was more like okay it's similar that you know these things overlap and and you know it's not like a crazy everything is new all at once sort of overstimulation um rather than just rather it being what it was and that was just kind of okay it's another competition for me and it's another way for me to try and you know compete at my best and that's kind of you know at the end of the day as an athlete all you're trying to do the amazing thing about 2016 you compete in four events in alpine then you also compete in one event in freestyle end up winning a bronze medal now it's crazy to think that you can do that uh, i mean i don't know how often this is something that alpine and freestyle skiers mix over i mean we're big fans of esther ledecka on this show mixing skiing and snowboarding but it's sort of a case of I would think this would be something that would be more common than a snowboarder and a skier kind of crossing over i mean how do you make that decision is it a case of you just you got selected for all the events so why not give it a crack and you end up winning a bronze in freestyle not alpine so I mean, yeah. how, how did that feel that you kind of won the medal in the one that you don't really concentrate on much i think it, i think it was probably bittersweet irony in 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 some respects you know i i think I, I knew i was going there for the focus of alpine um and that was still where i was you know most passionate and still am most passionate about and this, the being, you know, selected to and being able to compete in the ski cross just seemed like something, you know, fun to do. And, and, you know, I may as well do it if I'm there. Um, and it, and it just, it, you know, there is a, quite a lot of still crossover with the, with the ski cross, you know, it's still, you know, on the same equipment, you're still, you know, competing, um, you know, racing down the hill as fast as you can at some rate. And, you know, it's just that little added fun of, you know, competing against others, at the same time in ski cross, which is, I guess, different. Um, and I, and it just seemed like a lot of fun to me. And I think that's probably in my mind, why I did so well is because I just, there was no pressure in for me in my mind. It was just having fun. Uh, you know, it was just a bonus for me at that point. So I was like, why not, you know, go out and, you know, see what I can do and see where we get to. And, you know, when it came to the finals and I was sitting there in the finals, I was like, well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this is a win at any right. yeah. <laughs> you know it's a win at any rate you know whether i come down first or i come down last i'll take it and um yeah. and i think yeah i was just so 
happy to be there. I wasn't ever thinking about the result or thinking about, you know, what I needed to do to capitalize this, uh, you know, opportunity. It was just like, okay, just go out and see what you can do and see where you end up. And you created history, Louis, because you were Australia's first ever male Winter Olympic Youth Bronze Medalist. To this day, still, Australia's only ever Winter Youth Olympic Bronze Medalist male. So there, we there go. you go. Put that on your LinkedIn. Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Another one for the resume. Which, is it something then that is... I mean, has anyone done it? I don't know if anyone's ever like crossed over with ski cross and at an Olympics, like at a, at a full Olympics. Cause I mean, as you say, they're kind of, I feel they're a lot more connected ski cross and say a, a, a ski racing in Alpine than snowboarding and, and skiing. So I mean, is it something that's been done or could you have done it at Beijing? Like if you were competing in both circuits? I don't think that it has been done. I, I could be wrong um, and I might be wrong, but I, I don't, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's possible at at Beijing. Um, Obviously, you would have to be doing, you know, both circuits at the same time. And and there's obviously the the qualification requirements in in both events um, that you need to hit. But I'm sure, you know, there is a lot of, a lot of the, you know, male athletes, I know at least in ski cross nowadays, come from a background of alpine skiing. So I think, you know, there is for sure that, that, possibility of crossover it just depends on you know if you if you see yourself having the the time and capacity obviously you know it's always about how how thin are you going to spread yourself across you know so many disciplines before it becomes too much i guess yeah because i know obviously jenny owens was an alpine skier and ended up going to the olympics in in freestyle but it's just it's at that same games because like that, that's just such an amazing achievement to think that you've gone to a youth olympics in alpine oh, i'll just give a go a ski i'll oh, walk away with a bronze medal like i mean that's just okay like i i don't know if you know all of a sudden emma mckeon at the next olympics goes oh, i might try the 100 meter sprint accidentally wins a bronze medal like i mean it's just yeah. you know and it's it's a nice little achievement do, do you keep that medal like pride and place place somewhere like what do you sort of do with your youth olympics I- bronze? I honestly can't tell you where it is. I think my mom has it somewhere. <laughs> my mom has it hidden somewhere. I'm sure she'll pull it out when I'm I'm done ski racing and, ch- and tell me all about it. But uh, yeah, I think it. I don't know. I'm very much a progress driven person, so I think it's it's tough when you uh, you know you kind of you take it as a as a win at the time, and then you know I I can't say I've thought much about it ever since. Um, well, you're welcome you just kinda... today. You can bring it up. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You can do that. Exactly. Did it actually? Did it give you a sense of, huh? Why don't I maybe concentrate a little bit more on on the ski cross because this has happened? Did that at all enter your mind after those games? Uh, I think not really. Honestly, I, I think I, I've been always been so driven on on alpine skiing since I kind of committed to it that it, it. I've always had it in the back of my mind that maybe one day once I'm, you know. I feel like I've reached my limit in alpine skiing. Maybe I'll give it a crack and, and try out, you know, ski cross for a year, but I can't say I've ever, ever thought of transitioning, you know, before I feel like I've done all I can in, in alpine skiing at least. With that. And then obviously what was happening on the NCAA tour, was there any prospect of you going to the Pyeongchang Olympics sort of, were you on the cast or did sort of anything get close to that? Or was it always a focus on Beijing is, realistic and Pyeongchang never really was a possibility I think uh, I thought about it a little bit um obviously I was still pretty young so I didn't really I guess I I never focused so much um of my time or energy into actually trying to qualify and 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 make the Olympics I I kind of more just thought thought of it as a you know if I qualify by you know where I'm at and and by doing what I'm trying to do it currently then you know, that's a win. But I think I was in my mind, I was just, I wasn't ready for it. I didn't, I didn't know, you know, that level of com- competition and I, and I didn't feel ready for, you know, that level of commitment, not in the sense of going to an Olympics, but I guess in terms of, of committing to trying to make an Olympics, I think there is a lot more that goes into that, you know, added level of commitment to a sport. And I guess, from that period then though in the lead up to Beijing is that when all of a sudden that commitment sort of came about then you kind of realized what it was going to take to get an Olympics and the mindset sort of changed that that goal became a reality obviously leading towards 2022? 
For sure. I think, um, you know, after, after Pyeongchang and then through the next year, uh, I kind of realized, okay, you know, I, I really uh, do love this sport and I really do want to see how far I can go in this sport. Um, and I think when, when COVID hit, you know, I had a tough year, the year COVID hit, uh, the year of 2020, I, I, I kind of struggled a bit. And I think that was kind of, for me, the turning point of like, okay, I really do want to commit to this sport and how can I do it? Um, and then kind of 2021 with, with COVID, it didn't make sense in my mind to, to kind of jump ship and, and, and at that point go straight to Europe and, and be in a full new environment, I guess, again, without fully understanding, you know, what the world was doing at that point. Um, so I kind of stuck it out at, at university and then, um, you know, at the end of last year, um, or end of 2021, I was like, okay, definitely, this is the dream and, and I want to commit to trying to qualify for the Olympics. So how can I do that? And I kind of restructured, I guess, my life and, and where I was at towards trying to make that goal happen. Which I can imagine, obviously, you've got to make big sacrifices, big choices in order to that to, to get towards it. But with everything that you've gone through, what you were just mentioning, were you realistically thinking that if I put my mind to this, I commit to this, this is achievable i know i'm good enough to get to the olympics next year for sure i think any athlete will tell you that you have to be you know have that belief that you know if you are committed to that a goal that you have enough that you have the capabilities of achieving it um so i think for me it was more just a matter of deciding okay that is a goal and that is a goal that i really want to achieve um, and then it, once I decided that it was just a matter of, okay, what are the steps to get me there? What do I need to do, um, to make that a reality? And then it was just like, you know, kind of going down the list. What do I, what do I need to change? Where do I need to go? Um, how do I make it possible? How someone, you mentioned Greta before we've, we've had her on the show. Love Greta. I mean, how is she kind of in helping along the way? I don't know how much the women's and the men's intersect, whether or not they're always kind of together or they're separate, but having someone with that experience, obviously, is she sort of a great person to, to lean upon to get some advice to help you towards the Olympics? Um, I think a little bit. We sadly don't have a ton of, in Alpine skiing, we don't really don't have a lot of overlap between male and female. There's, you know, very much different circuits and, and we're often training in very different areas um, during the season, which is tough. But um, I think, you know, growing up and, and being around her whenever I w could, you know, it was definitely someone to talk to and, and ask for advice on things. And then as well as, you know, the people that were older than me um, as a male athlete as well, whether it was Harry uh, Laidlaw, who was at Pyeongchang and, and is still competing now and, and asking for his experiences and knowledge and and being, you know, just able to talk to, you know, anyone in the sport that, you know, has really, you know, had those experiences or, or being around the the world of ski racing long enough that they've kind of seen a thing or two. Because I can imagine it's a, obviously a tight-knit community with the fact that, again, to go back to, say, swimming when, you know, we're sending multiple athletes per Olympics, whereas, like, particularly, say, on the, on the male side of things, you know, we haven't had a whole lot of alpine skis in the last, uh, you know, 10 or so years. So I can imagine that's a small little community where you can go to, to Harry or people like that to, to get that advice as well. For sure. Yeah, it's definitely, especially from Australia, we most of us who have competed and, and are competing still know each other and, and, and can talk to each other and, and, you know, try and help each other on, on our own journeys and to get to where we want to go. With all that in mind, you set yourself that goal, you work towards it, you get selected for Beijing. Do you remember that moment when you officially knew you were going to the Olympics? Uh, I think I do. I don't really know. I think it's tricky with skiing. Uh, it's not like any other sport, I would say. We, we compete so much during a season um, that you know, it's so, it's so hectic between kind of November through till, you know, end of March where kind of nonstop competitions traveling throughout Europe or, or North America that it's kind of all full on. And I think it never really sunk in till I was basically traveling to the airport um, to head over just because of how, you know, how much it was going on at the time, whether it was, you know, trying to make sure that, you know, you're not getting sick with COVID before, before leaving and, and, 
and you know you're competing still before, while the selections are going on and trying to trying to make sure you hit you know selection criteria and and whatever else you, you it's all kind of so full on i think in ski racing that it never really quite hit me that hard until i was like oh crap like all right well <laughs> you know, driving China. to the airport, like we're going to China, like, <laughs> I guess this is legit, you know, you're, you're doing all your extra COVID tests and, and this and that. And it was like, okay, this is, this is really a thing. Cause it's always that question I love finding out uh, from our guests is that moment, maybe when you think you're Olympian or you work out, Hey, I'm an Olympian, you know, is it the moment you're selected, the moment you're on the starting gates, the, the moment you're in the opening ceremony? I mean, was there a moment through all of that, that you were like, wow, I'm an Olympian now. I think it was probably when I left for me, honestly, it was like, I kind of got to reflect a bit and I was like, okay, you know, I've been through it all and I've seen it now and I I know what it's about. And and I kind of was like, okay, that's, that's what an Olympics is, you know, and that's what it's about. And I think that was for me when I kind of was like, okay, that's, that's in my mind when I became an Olympian probably. But I think if anything, it just shed out, like in my mind, it was like a thing of, that's what it's like. Now let's go back. Like, how do I get there again? And I think that was kind of the biggest kicker for me. It was like leaving. It was like, okay, you achieved it, but you didn't really do as much as you wanted to do. So how do you, what's the next steps to get back? Like what, what are we going to do from now till, you know, four years? Yeah. It's that competitiveness, that sort of addictive nature of kind of, which do you take a moment though at all to soak in other things? Like I always like to find out whether you get to do the opening ceremony, village life, things like that. I mean, are you sort of able to soak in a lot of that or is that a case of, well, this is only my first one. I can do this at the next one. You know, I worry about that next time around right now. I just want to get out there and compete. Yeah, I think, I don't know. I'm probably the worst person to ask for something like that I, I very much um uh, am very much competition driven so i think i i was excited about that sort of stuff but not to the same extent i was excited about the competition side so i was very much like kind of got there and was like okay like let's go train let's get this thing going like what how do i set myself up for the best success um and i think i probably didn't take full advantage of of the you know the other side of the Olympics until it was probably too late. And I was kind of like done competing and I was like, okay, let's go watch another event and let's go see what <laughs> else is going on. And, and it was kind of like, well, shoot, maybe I should have like seen a little more of this when it was happening. But Multiple I think going, Louis, you got plenty to go. Like you can do this in 2020, 2030, right? You got so many more to go. <laughs> exactly. That's the hope. I figured I'll, I'll catch up on the next one. Exactly. Did you, when, what did you end up going to see? Did you see anything exciting that you sort of were like, wow, I'm glad to be here to, to witness this? Uh, so I watched a few of the um, bobsledding and, and, and slide track events, um, which was kind of crazy to watch. It's, it's just such a different uh, uh, world of competition and um, very much different to ski racing. You know, it's very same track, same, you know, preparation and, and it's very, uh, I guess ski racing is very much a wild card event. You know, you kind of always, you know, the weather's always different every day and, and, and something's always different. So you're kind of always trying to adjust where it's sent. It was kind of interesting to see them where it's very much, you know, mo- as much as possible, everything's the same for them. You know, they're trying to do the same warm up, the same preparation, same track, you know, same routines and, and really just dial everything in as well as they can. And for me, it, it kind of set, felt foreign because it was like, oh, this is like not what I get to do. I, you know, I'm like <laughs> trying to figure it out day by day and like trying to give yourself the best preparation on that day um, for the, you know, conditions and so on. So it was cool to see that. And then I also got to see uh, Greta compete in the Alpine combined, which was cool to be able to go up and, and watch another Alpine event and actually see what's going on. Was there much, I've asked this a few time six some of our winter athletes i mean obviously australia's most successful winter olympics in terms of medals won things are spread out a lot in beijing you're not all obviously together in one place but was there some sort of vibe that still translated through the team with that success that you're able to kind of feel you know goal to jakara you know you're at the sliding jackie's doing all right you've obviously got scotty and um tess doing well i mean was that a vibe you could feel within australia that it was buoyed on by the success that was happening in beijing 
I think for sure. I think with anything, it, it, it was cool mostly to see in my mind that Australia is becoming more known and, and more, uh, I'm not sure what the word I'm looking for, but yeah, more known and, and more competitive, I should say, in, in winter sports. You know, it, it was awesome to see that, you know, Australia, you know, is no longer considered just a, you know, a sport of, you know, summer Olympics and, and we do summer events and there's a few of us that, you know, compete in the wintertime. It's like, no, we actually are real competitors in the winter Olympics and we are being successful, which was, you know, awesome to see. I mentioned at the top, obviously, 23rd in the giant slalom, which is the best ever finished by an Australian male, equals Zali as well from Alberville. Obviously, you said, though, be a bit more. I mean, it was like the worst blizzard, wasn't it, in Beijing or something like that in about three years, terrible conditions, everything along those lines. I mean, obviously something you felt you you could have gone a bit better. Did you set yourself a goal? Was there something going into the Olympics? Like, I want to be top 20 or I want to be a certain place. And I guess kind of at the end of the day, you felt you could have maybe gone a little bit better than 23rd, even though that's a, obviously a fantastic finish. I think, I think for me, I didn't necessarily have a goal in terms of place or, or finish. I, I think I just knew how I wanted to ski. And I think the, you know, the bittersweet for me was I didn't ski as well as I had hoped. And I had a few, few big mistakes that I was really quite frustrated with, um, which kind of was the biggest kicker for me. It was like bittersweet that, you know, okay, there was a lot of good, good things that came out of it. But it was like, you know, I, it was almost like I'd left some on the table, you know. You didn't quite get all that you could have out of it, um, which is which is the frustrating part in any athlete, I think, when you, when you leave things on the table and you, and you leave, you know, the door open for someone else. Um, and I think that, you know, is good and bad because I think it drove, it's driven me more and, and you know, pushed me on to, okay, what do I need to do now over the next years to try and be better for the, you know, for the next Olympics and for the next competitions? Like, how do I prepare myself best for that? Um, in, in terms of the, like, from run one to run two, when it sort of comes to that, that feel um, that you're sort of going on there, leaving things on the table, how much goes through your mind in what you can change from that first run to the second run, particularly when the conditions probably get worse from that point i mean is that just all you're sort of so focused on okay in run one i did this did this this gate here this gate here need to do this need to do that and how do you kind of turn that around into the second run to try and improve on what you've done in the first run yeah so i think i think it's a, a matter of just trying to refocus and, and figure out mentally where you can improve and where you know you you kind of reevaluate and say okay what did i what did i hit and what did i miss and where was i struggling and and then you kind of go okay how do i better that in the second run you know you're just always trying to improve and 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 figure out how you can maximize yourself you know especially in ski racing you know as long as if you can maximize your ability and, and your capacity on that day you're you're you know already setting yourself up for success in my mind so it's you know it was just a matter of that for me it was where do i need to change and what do i need to improve on to to give myself the best opportunity from here and is that a case of do you have something mentally that maybe you can take your mind off it to help you with that? Do you put some tunes on? Do you just kind of relax, get some quiet, get away from people? I mean, is there sort of something mentally that helps you kind of focus on what you were just talking about there? For, for me, it's just trying to be present. You know, whether I, if sometimes I, some races I feel like putting in some music, some races I, you know, want to be super zen. Some races I try and just you know, hang out with, with the people I know there and, and, and connect with people. And, and yeah, I guess it, it's just, for me, it's just being present and trying to, you know, be current and, and not think about what's to come and what's past and, and just try and be there and, and go with how I'm feeling at the time and not try and give myself, you know, any, anything to stop me or any hindrance. And how bad were the conditions? And how much does that affect you, those conditions? Because, I mean, it's a worst blizzard in like three years. I can't imagine that that's something you're waking up like, ah, oh, this is fine. This is just, you know, casual casual Olympics. Why not? <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's definitely, it definitely makes it tough. Um, but I think any, any, any competitor will tell you, you know, it's just another thing you just have to deal with. You know, everyone out there is dealing with it. So it's just how you know, how do you maximize yourself for it? You know, you've trained in those conditions, probably, you know, you try and draw from those experiences and then, you know, take it and go, let's, you know, it's another challenge to try and, to try and handle, you know, not never a hindrance. 
Because I think as soon as, at least for me, as soon as I kind of see those things as an obstacle and, and a hindrance to me, it's like I'm defeating myself or I'm, def- I'm, I'm giving someone else a leg up on, on it rather than just me accepting it and trying to make the most out of it. You're talking about, you know, that, that hunger that this Olympics has given you to go towards more. I can imagine, obviously, the slalom, unfortunately, not being able to finish that. That's something that no doubt has, has fueled that fire, not being able to finishing it. You want to come back in four years' time, not only finishing it, but obviously get everything you're talking about leaving on the table, take it off that damn table and get down to the bottom of the hill. For sure. Um, yeah, I think, I think it just, you know, that fire and, and the slalom and things like that, it, you know, it's experience. I, you know, I try and, I try and take all the, you know, the positives and negatives and, you know, you're learning whatever you're doing. Um, and as long as you're learning, you, you're taking it as progress. So it's, I think for me, you know, the biggest learning at that point was like, what did I do wrong? And, and in my mind, it was just a mental error of, of being in the wrong headspace and, and being in a, in a place where I was, you know, too, too amped up and too excited to compete and not, not focusing on my craft enough. And I think that's where, you know, I had trouble in the, in the slalom and it's, it's a matter of, okay, now, now I know, now I know what is too much and in those big events and how do I now adjust and, and learn from that for the future, whether it's racing, you know, in, in this year or in world champs or wherever I race next, it's like, okay, how do I draw from that experience? How do I learn from, from that mistake? I, saw a lot during the Olympics that you hadn't obviously, I think, seen your parents in a few years at that point. And obviously being a COVID Olympic still, you know, not a lot of people could really go there. What was the support at least like from home? I mean, I can imagine too, for somebody who sadly doesn't get the attention as some of our other athletes do in between Olympic cycles, it's, you know, wow, people want to hear a little bit more about Louis, but just your family, the support, social media, everything along those lines. I mean, how was all of that to come from the Olympics? I think it was, it was, it was a lot of fun and, and it was, it was cool to be able to have that recognition. Um, I think in, in Alpine skiing and especially from Australia, it's kind of understated as to how, you know, hard um, the sport can be and how, how much work goes into it. Um, you know, just not just out in the Olympics and it's not just like, you know, we're, we're we're hanging out just the year of the Olympics and, and then the other three years we're chilling and not really doing much. Um, so it was really, it was a nice feeling to be able to get that recognition and, and, and see that people were, um, you know, interested in and, and showing support. And I think it, the biggest thing for me was trying to, trying to spread the, the word that this is a, this is a sport that is, you know, growing in Australia rather than declining and, and people are, trying to show that people, you know, that there is interest in ski racing and it's not just a, a novelty event for Australia. I think that was, I think that was what I really enjoyed most about the media side of, of the Olympics. Cause I can imagine if there's some little kid watching those Olympics, you know, little boy, little girl who's gone, wow, okay, that looks cool. I didn't realize Australia could ski, you know, to have perhaps one person that maybe you're influencing that in a few years time, they might say, Hey, Louis, I saw you at the Beijing Olympics. That got me into skiing. I mean, I can imagine that is a massive reward no matter where you finish at an Olympics. For sure. I think, and I think that's what I noticed when I came home and I, and I went back to skiing at my race club this year in Mount Hotham um, and seeing, you know, the overwhelming um, feedback from the community there of, of how many people enjoyed watching me compete and enjoyed, you know, seeing me compete at the Olympics and saying, okay, like, you know, you came from this, this club and you came from this environment, like this is a possibility, um, you know, for those young athletes. And I think it, it's, it's awesome to be able to show people that that pathway is possible and that, that there are those opportunities available for you rather than it being, you know, some far away object that, you know, is never really achievable. I'm telling you, the statue is going to happen based on all of that. You know? <laughs> See, like it's just, it's, it's going to be one. Exactly. It's going, it's going to be built there. Now, Lou, before we wrap up with a sort of just fun sort of get to know you style questions, I mean, it's been now at the time of recording this six months since the Olympics. Uh, so obviously focus now, 2026. Uh, what else sort of is on, on the pipeline now for, for yourself back into training, competing, kind of what, what's on the agenda now? Yeah, so the focus is, you know, long-term 2026 Olympics and, and, and getting there. And I think the, 
the focus now will be predominantly trying to, you know, compete on the World Cup circuit um, the next couple of years and, and spend my time predominantly in Europe um, competing and, and training over there and, and trying to get myself to a level that when 2026 rolls around, I'm in a position of, okay, you know, I feel like a real competitor and, and I'm at a stage in my career where, you know, I, I can really peak and, and that's a, you know, a place where I can show my best and, and try and uh, do, you know, do my country proud, so to speak. Um, and I think it's just a matter now of, of, you know, trying to figure out the steps to get there. And, and that's kind of where I'm at this year and, and at this part of the, the season. And is it a case of two, like I'm sort of looking through your website and everything and sort of we know some of Australia's winter athletes kind of financial support is always a benefit. I mean, if people are listening or watching on YouTube to this right now, can people jump on board, support you? I mean, I can imagine that's something you're always uh, open to if somebody uh, might be wanting to do that for you. Yes, for sure. And I think the the best two ways is, is through the Australian Sports Foundation um, is kind of where I, I have a, a donation platform there, which is tax deductible and, and often whether it's family and friends donating through there um, or reaching out directly, whether it's companies and, and trying to find sponsorships through through that respect, whether it's direct through email or going through, like you said, my website, um, you know, those those avenues to try and to try and build support and, and build, you know, I guess a culture around around ski racing in Australia. I think a lot of people don't, fully realize how much of an international sport and international following there is um, in ski racing and, and trying to get that, get that out there and, and show people, you know, that there is, there is a brand behind that and, and a, an interest behind it. Just some merchandising ideas. You can take these as, as much as you want. Uh, obviously cowbells, all I think about Alpine skiing, the, the Louis cowbell. I don't know if like any big name skis in Europe sort of market a cowbell with their face on it or, if you're familiar with, of course, I'm sure you are, Louis the Fly, the old Morteen campaign. You could like have a, a Louis Fly that. swatter or something like that that you could be waving at to, a ski, you know? Like, I might have to. I might have to get on one of those. I think that's yeah. a pretty good one. I think the cowbell is definitely a, a lifelong dream. Uh, there's a few <laughs> World Cup events um, in Europe that that the winning prizes are cowbells. Nice. Um, so if I can one day win a World Cup that that gives me a cowbell, that's for sure going to be a thing. Yeah, I love these prizes because I remember Greta telling us that she won a giant thing of chupa chups for winning a, yeah. an event once. So, like, I love the prizes in alpine skiing. This is, it sounds like they've got some great things going out there. Yeah, there's definitely there's a few exciting ones. There's one in uh, Finland that they do um, that you win a reindeer and you get oh, to name you win a, reindeer. a reindeer. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, so that's a. There's a few crazy prizes, so they you win it and you get to name it, and then they they keep it in a farm. Um, oh right, I thought you'd have to take it on the plane on the way back. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily extra not. <laughs> Luckily not. But wow. they'll keep it for you, and, and you get to go visit your reindeer every year. So. Oh, isn't that sweet? I like it. Yeah. Hopefully, it doesn't end up on someone's dinner table. Like if you don't go and visit it or something like that. Uh, exactly. So we wrap up with a sort of fun get to know you style questions. As always, these are based on a questionnaire that team canada gave their athletes ahead of rio and pyeongchang there is a drawing element again it's a it's a voluntary aspect if you are a good drawer you like drawing there's a couple of aspects here you can draw a picture of yourself there's a draw a place from your hometown or draw a picture of your favorite animal just putting it out there louis oh boy. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if i'm gonna be in the drawing that's definitely that's all right. uh, i chose the sports not the arts department <laughs> yeah. so. i like that there you go uh we'll start off with your favorite olympic moment is Ooh, my favorite olympic moment is i would have to say i was very young at the time but it would have to be kathy freeman Yes. Um, at the Sydney Olympics, that was probably You're going to be like two. Do you remember it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember it, but I remember my parents talking about it for years after. So I'd say that that's counts. probably a pretty iconic one for me. Absolutely. Um, and I remember growing up and, and that being a big, you know, a big uh, moment in our, in Australia's sporting history. So I'd, I'd have to say that's probably one of my biggest. 
and we're about 10 years away. You'll just be able to remember the next uh, time we host an Olympics, Louis, in Brisbane in 10 years, you know, so you'll exactly. be able to kind of uh, hopefully remember that. Well, let's, go, let's get alpine skiing for the Brisbane Olympics. I don't know how it would work, but um, <laughs> 10 years to build a mountain uh, in Brisbane. You never know. You, you never know. It's possible. Anything's possible these days. We've got the Jeff Henke Centre, right? They can build a big hill there, so why not? Exactly. Um, if, you have, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Teleportation. That's an easy yes. one. With the amount of travel I do with ski racing, <laughs> teleportation would be a godsend. Simple. Boom. Just that way. Simple. Did you end click, up seeing your parents when you got home? Can I ask you that? Like, did you finally get to catch up with them? I did. Three and a half years or just under three and a half years of not seeing my parents. Oh, no, sorry. Wow. Three and a half years since I was home, two and a half since I saw my parents. So wow. it was a long time. Long time. And I'd say I got about a week and then I was like, all right, I think I might have to take a break. <laughs> this, this is good, mum and dad. Thanks. It's been fun. Uh, but I've got to go. Yeah, to <laughs> exactly. A few, few family dinners and I was like, yeah, the argument's coming back. Yeah. I can see why it's been two and a half years. Um, exactly. Your favorite sports movie is? Ooh, favorite sports movie. Um, honestly, it pro- it's a funny one. It'd be Happy Gilmore. Oh, yes. Good answer. Yeah, Classic. that's a pretty iconic one for me. Yeah, like, does, it, does it make you, whenever you play golf, like do you just get tempted to do the whole Happy Gilmore sort of drive? or Every now and again, yeah. I more do the putting. I, I, I usually <laughs> yell at my ball when I'm putting because I suck at putting. So <laughs> that's usually my move. But What's wrong with you? You want to go home? The hole is your home. <laughs> exactly. Just start screaming at it. Uh, your funniest childhood memory is? funniest childhood memory um i remember one of the funny i wouldn't say it was funny at the time but it's funny looking back on it was uh when i was on the farm um i remember filling up the tractor with my dad one time late at night um after it had gotten dark and it, i was i was standing over the fuel uh, like where the fuel up was and because it, it was on top of the on top of where the um motor was and I, he said he was like yeah look down in it make sure like tell me when it's close to the top um, cause we were, you know, we just had a hand pump on a 44 gallon drum and I'm standing over it and I'm like, yeah, it's almost there. It's almost there. And he's like, no, it can't be almost there. Like I've only done like two turns and I'm like, it's almost there. And he like keeps whining it, keeps whining it. And then it all sprays up and sprays all over me. So I went to school for the rest of the week smelling like diesel fuel. And that was pretty. Wow. And that's why yeah. you didn't see your parents for two and a half years, basically. That's uh, maybe one of them. <laughs> Moments like that. Thanks, Dad. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, your favorite pump up song is? Favorite pump up song? Um, I don't know if I have one. I'm, I'm, more, I'm more of a uh, like chilled music for a pump up. It's weird, but okay. I very much uh, go to the lo fi route the or. Area. Oh, yeah. Yeah, nice. very much relaxed music rather than the pump up music. So that works. Not a okay. good one to ask for that question. Well, I think that that that's a solid answer though for that one, Louis. I think that that can be worked in in a pump up one. Um, the most recent TV show you binge watched? Uh, I'm still currently binge watching it, but I'm watching the Sandman on. Uh, ah, nice. On Netflix, it's been pretty good so far. It's not that's not good. that exciting, but something nothing. I think my all-time favorite binger, though, I'll change the question, um, has to be Entourage. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Were you a fan of the movie yeah. that they did a few years back? Wasn't much of a fan of the movie. No. Much more of a fan of the TV show. Yeah. It's kind of always that way, isn't it? They, they take a few years away and then sort of doesn't quite get the same. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. 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 I, I mean, it's a problem now. We've got so many streaming services. There's always something at least there to watch. So, exactly. You know. have you ever, have Too much you ever, to choose I'm, from. Don't think I've ever asked this to an Olympian, but have you ever checked out the Olympic channel? Like, I don't know if I'm just a geek who just sits there and watches, like, all oh, the 2002 downhills on the Olympic channel. I'm going to sit down and watch this. <laughs> I can't say I have. I cannot say I have. <laughs> yeah, just ignore think... that. This is just the Olympic geek here uh, outing myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's entertaining. It's, it's, and they had, I remember at one point they had, um, like, the opening ceremony channel, so they would just play random opening ceremonies. And if you ever want to see a weird opening ceremony, the 94 Winter Olympics, it's scary. Uh, so really? just uh, lots of maybe black when I'm, maybe pros. When I'm bored, I'll, and, yeah, check I'll it look out. It up. It's very interesting. interesting. Um, your least favorite foods are least favorite foods. Um, tomatoes by themselves. Wow. I'll eat tomatoes in things anytime by mm-hmm. itself. Can't eat it. 
Um, what else? I'm pretty. I'm pretty easy going. Otherwise, I always like the pro- finding a fellow tomato disliker because it's sort of yeah. one of those things where some people look at you funny, like tomato. Really, that's such a basic food. But yeah, no, I'm. But I'll, I'll eat it on a hamburger. That's the weird thing. I'll have a really? burger. Ah, okay. I'll have a burger, and if it's like a good burger and there's a tomato in it, I don't mind it. Or like I'll eat, you know, like red sauce and pastas and all that. Yep. Like totally fine with it. But if it's like a piece of tomato on a sandwich, no, nah, not doing yep. it. Interesting. Yeah, I'm sort yeah. of, I'm fine with like tomato sauce, like the pasta stuff, all that's fine. But yeah, like tomato on, yeah, I'm not a tomato on a burger fan, which it, which it throws yeah. me when a lot of places feel it's a standard ingredient. So they don't list it in the ingredients. So when they say like, yeah, it's just one of the burger, staples. It's like a patty plus tomato. Yeah, they just assume that yeah. everything has a tomato on it. I'm like, well, you didn't, t- uh, yeah. So anyway, small, <laughs> small gripes. Uh, if you weren't an athlete, what would you be? If I wasn't an athlete, what would I be? I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty. Uh, I like I like tinkering with things. So I I could guess I would be something fixing things. I don't know. I'm always a tinkerer. Not filling um, up fuel. So that, I hope. Just uh, definitely not out. filling up fuel. That's a, that's a <laughs> staying away from that part of it. But yeah, I I'd probably end up tinkering with something uh, somewhat okay. something along those lines is there much tinkering you can do with the skis is that sort of something technical you can sort of play around a bit with a lot there's a lot of tinkering you can do in the equipment which is a dangerous it's a dangerous dark rabbit hole that you can dive down so <laughs> that's that's i try, too, I try not to tinker too much exactly. there's, there's too much going a deep on dark there. hole there <laughs> uh where is your favorite vacation spot Where's my favorite? It'd have to be, I would, I would say it would have to be probably Bali. Nice. Because like I grew up getting to go there a little bit. Um, we'd sometimes go there for family holidays and being a, a winter athlete, I think we spent so much time in the winter that anytime I get summer vacations, I'm down for it. And Bali is kind of at least close to home. So I was going to say, is this a case of that? You just, you're always trying to find a beach whenever you've got some time off because you're so sick of snow. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> if I can get a week of summer here and there, I'll take a week of summer here and there. Can't imagine there's too many beaches close to Harrietville, so I mean, it's sort of uh... not too many. <laughs> not, not, not. It's a, a bit of a trek. Of <laughs> yeah, just a it's bit. A bit just of a trek. A bit. No, no Olympic surfers coming from Harrietville anytime soon, probably. Um, what's something people usually describe you as? Um, what's something people usually describe? Probably, um, an in- I have an intense personality when it comes okay. to uh, competing. So right. that would probably be one of them. Intense and the other would probably, yeah, I'm very much a dislike losing. So <laughs> I'll try very hard at things I shouldn't be trying hard at. But no I've got to say, if that's the case, I watched your... Um channel seven interviews after each of your races you were very calm like i'm thinking if you know like did you take a few moments to smash a couple of skis after that slalom run <laughs> oh, g'day that channel was, seven how you doing <laughs> there was quite a there was a there was a nice window of time between the the <laughs> run and the interview that's the trick i just make sure i'm cooled down before i do anything like smash that smash a couple of things behind the scenes and, ah, channel seven here we go <laughs> exactly <laughs> let's do this um now you mentioned before you're a tigers fan I'm, I'm assuming this might be the answer growing up which uh team what was your main sporting team that you followed uh it would have to be tigers and then still a rugby fan so as well wallabies Ah, oh, nice so i've got to say with the tigers like um i mean i i'm a Carlton fan laugh at me all you want but like it's sort of growing up yeah, yeah, yeah. i always had a soft spot for richmond because they were just the team that like every year it was the same like we're gonna be doing well and you'd always finish ninth. so i was actually very happy when you guys started winning although i have to say <laughs> after a couple of years meeting cocky richmond supporters was a weird thing i'd never experienced yeah. that before so <laughs> that's true it's it's been a it's been a changing of guard the last few years so it's, yeah i'm praying i'm praying you didn't uh jinx us and we're gonna stay in the top eight now for <laughs> this year but... yes. well, hey, you've, got, you've got you're pretty much there you're gonna talk to, to me got... about playing collingwood this week i'm not feeling it we choked in the 11 seconds ago the other day we should be in <laughs> that's right we had a few of those this year as well yeah. We had way too many easy losses. And it was do you just get, silly. back in 2017 when you first won the the Premiership, do you get swept up in like the merchandise? Like it's been so long, I've got to buy every single piece of Premiership merchandise. And then after like 2020, you're just like, eh, well, too many of these now. 
Nah, I'm I'm very much not a merchandise guy at all. So I'm I'm probably the opposite. I was more just like about time. Like I've been <laughs> watching for too many years, and now it's finally like oh. All right, we got a championship. I can actually like be proud of something rather than just yep. being a supporter of uh, maybe next year. The ninth team. We finished ninth again. Uh, good, exactly. Good time. Uh, maybe good. next year we take something there. But... <laughs> You've had three in the last few years now, so another 10 years of not winning. It's not that bad anymore. Uh, no, like... we got to get get one more and then we'll have a dynasty in our court. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, you never know. It's, it's, it's possible. If you could be an Olympian in any other sport besides your own, what would it be? Ooh. Um, Olympian in any other sport. I would probably choose. Uh, that's a tough one. I, I probably I think I have a few because I, I give us a few. Kind of like um, diving would be pretty fun yep. in my mind. Diving looks like a lot of fun, and hundred meter track because it just seems like the sport that everyone watches no matter what. Like yep. you can have no idea about the Olympics and you still somehow know the result of the Olymp- like Olympic hundred meters. That's a good point. You grow a mullet like Rowan Browning and you just, you know, all of a sudden you set that golf going as well and flowing in the wind. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Is there many mullets in skiing? I mean, mullets are coming back. I can't imagine like having a mullet flowing out the back of the helmet, you know? It's not, it's not yet a thing in ski racing. I think it, I, I can't imagine it'll come to a ski racing that hard, but. <laughs> You never know. I might You've be got the moustache. That's enough, Louis. Like that's 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 noticeable enough, right? Like that's all you exactly. need. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that's 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 your trademark. Uh, final question for you: What is your guilty pleasure? I mean, this could be anything that you can think of. Uh, it'd have to be surfing. Okay. Hundred percent. Surfing is my guilty pleasure. I love surfing as much as I can, anytime I can. I'm Any good? For Could it. this be a change of Olympic career, maybe for Brisbane? There you I go. Don't think I, I don't think I'm anywhere near good enough to be in an Olympics, but uh, I'm all right. I'll, I'll get. I can get away with two. So I'll call. That's, that's, I'll call. I'm all that's right. the main thing. You, you're doing. Exactly. You're doing better than most. So that works. Louis, uh, before I let you go, I mentioned obviously you got a website, uh, but plug your website, social media. Where can people stay up to date with what everything that you got going on in the future? Yeah, so the easiest place is probably louismillen.com. Um, is the easiest place to to find kind of my website, and then and then from there is my ASF uh, donation platform. Um, or Louis Mullen on on Instagram is probably my main source of social media. Um, I try I try to keep it up to date as much as possible. <laughs> I'm not a very good uh, social media person, but um, yeah, that's kind of the two two main ones, and and. Yeah, and if you have any any uh, inter, inter, interest in, in, you know, corporate sponsorships or things like that, reach out either through the through our website, my email's on there, or, or um, yeah, my email's also on my on my Instagram. Well, hopefully we can uh, get you some of those along the way there too, Lou, because this has been a lot of fun to, to learn about your journey, your Olympic experiences, and uh, everything else in between. Really appreciate your time off the podium. I would probably say go Tigers right now, but no, I'm not going to. So uh, I hope you do, right. I hope you do better right. than Collingwood. I'll just say that. We'll be, we'll be fine. Round 23 is going to be no worries, and, and we'll be sailing into the, into the playoffs.